Today I'm going to tell you about a 100% sure word of prophecy. 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 19 says, We have also a more sure word of prophecy. It goes on. The Bible has a lot of prophecies in it. And I'm going to give you one that is 100% for sure. You see it behind me here. I'm going to go through this whole chart here behind me. And I'm going to give you something that you can count on that will happen 100% for sure. This is not going to be a false prophecy. Um, I'm going to tell you it's going to happen. Right now we're in the uh, time before the selection here. People call it the election in America. The 2020 election. Trump or Biden, who's it going to be? Well, nobody really knows for sure. Uh, nobody can really say for sure, except for the people behind the scenes, but we won't get into that. But uh, I can't prophesy who's going to win. Give you some thoughts on it later. But I can, can give you a prophecy of what's going to happen here that it is a 100% sure word of prophecy. And I'm going to back it up with the scriptures from my King James Bible. Ed, and you say, what is that prophecy? Right up here. The Roman Catholic Church in complete control. All right. And we'll get into this as we continue. We're actually going to go back. We're going to show you what the future prophecy is and how the world is going to be led up into it. Okay, so let's start out here. Revelation chapter, let me go over this way. Revelation chapter 17 up here. Revelation chapter 17 verses 1 and 2 is where the prophecy is given about Roman Catholicism. So turn in your King James Bible. And it's so important to turn in your Bible. Make sure I'm telling you the truth. Revelation chapter 17 verses 1 and 2. And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. All right. Notice it says there, the kings of the earth have committed fornication with this great whore. Obviously, the whore uh, there is symbolic, but uh, what church is called the Mother Church, the Holy Mother Church? Uh, that would be Roman Catholicism. Where do all the Protestants come from? Roman Catholicism. If you really study it out, where do, does uh, Islam come from? Roman Catholicism. Again, the world religions are all subservient to one system. The kings of the earth, they go and they meet with one ruler. And who would that be? That would be the Pope. And we see this whole coronavirus thing that's going on right now. All world leaders are acting together. They're all closing their countries. They're all doing this different stuff. And, you know, most of them are doing the same things, which proves what? That there's a central guiding power there. And if you study history for the last 2,000 years, you will see time and time again people serving the Roman Catholic system. The Roman Catholic Church has been there for 2,000 years to basically control the different political systems out there, the pol different political uh, groups and whatnot which we'll get into as we continue here. But uh, you say, what's this fornication thing about? Well, fornication is very simple. Uh, fornication is a King James Bible word for sex outside of marriage, um, sexual intercourse. Well, what do you have? You have a male and a female joining together in that process. All right. This whore, this great whore in Revelation 17, and she is symbolized down in uh, um, verse 4, and the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet collar. Okay, Now this woman is known for being purple and scarlet. Right? Now if you study it, the bishops, the archbishops and things, they wear purple robes, whereas the cardinals wear red. And you can look at the huge Vatican processionals, it's purple and scarlet. Right? I realize that their flag is yellow and white, but the collars of the Vatican are purple and scarlet of her... Uh, you know, hierarchy, so to speak. But it's very interesting because if you study Roman Catholicism, as I have for many years, you will see that they have two trinities, two sets of gods, so to, so to speak. They have the heavenly trinity, which consists of Holy Spirit, Son, and Father. And then they have the what they call the earthly trinity, which is Mary, Joseph, and Jesus. Now, what do you get when you combine those two triangles? This one symbolizes female in the occult. This one symbolizes male. You put them together, you get a hexagram, a very powerful symbol in the occult, a symbol for fornication, 
and it's intertwined sixes if you look at into it. You can see some of my other studies on that. But what do we see here? The kings of the earth are committing fornication with Mystery Babylon. So that means that Mystery Babylon is in control. The Roman Catholic Church is in, in control. Just last night, October the 1st, they had the Al Smith dinner where both Biden and Trump go and they both are there and they both talk about being submissive to the Roman Catholic Church. And I was told by some of the brethren, I haven't had a chance to look into it, more coming out on this in the future, but Trump reiterated his pro promise in the first, throughout the first election when he did it at the Al Smith dinner four years ago. And he said, I'm going to end anti-Catholic bias and anti-Catholic bigotry. Uh, Trump is, a, is in the back pocket of the, the Vatican, as all the kings are. They all are. Trained Jesuits or they have connections to Roman Catholicism. You say, what about Biden? Check into his connections. He's connected to the Vatican. All these guys are. Um, and you'll get these people, these prophecy teachers, and they'll come out and they'll say, well, we think that the uh, Antichrist kingdom is going to be a new age, new world order, or it's going to be a Islamic Antichrist or something. Nonsense. Total nonsense. That's not what the Bible teaches. The King James Bible teaches that it's the Vatican, the Roman Catholic Church. They are the ones that come back to full power, and I'm going to explain how that's done. All right? Again, a lot of people think, well, the Vatican City is just a small little city. Yes, but look into the knighthoods. Look into who the Vatican controls. The Knights of the Equestrian Order, the Knights of, of Malta, the Knights of uh, Columbus. The Knight, you go down through all these, the Knights Templar, all of them. All these different organizations that exist within Freemasonry and with a lot of the other systems, and you look at the big powerful men in charge of things and, and uh, businesses and whatever else, and they all go back to Catholic knighthoods. Hmm. Which we'll talk about as we continue. But what leads up to this? The great harlot rides the beast. There is a man coming, the man of sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist, the beast. He's called by different titles throughout the Bible. And this great harlot rides the beast. She's in control of the Antichrist. He will be a Roman Catholic, in other words, a future pope. Probably not even, a, maybe not even a pope, but there, when their Christ shows up, they will glorify him as God. The Bible talks about that. They will actually worship him like he's God. So let's look at Revelation 17, verses 3 through 8. And we'll see some more scripture here. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-collared beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns, and the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet collar, like we saw up here, purple and scarlet collar, and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Can you show me any other world leader, any other leader of religion that uh, is more decked out with gold and silver and everything else? Look at the Vatican processionals and, and things. It's the Pope. That's what it's talking about here. It's talking about Roman Catholicism. Look at the, the treasury of the Vatican. It's incredible the, the kind of money that these people have. Just untold amounts of wealth. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. All right. And I have a whole video on that, so I'm not going to get into why he said he wondered with great admiration. But the point is here, no other system out there can be guilty of the thing of shedding the blood of, of the martyrs and saints of Jesus, more so than the Roman Catholic Church. Just millions, tens of millions of people look into the Inquisition years and the Dark Ages and what they did. The Roman Catholic Church just slaughtered people. Again, I've shown in videos the original their first English translation, the Dewey Reams, that came out in 1610, one year before the authorized version, later called the King James Version. That Dewey Reams Bible, back in Revelation 17, literally with this verse, talks about, this, this isn't talking about the blood of heretics, because, you know, killing the heretics is, is no different than killing any other criminal out there. They literally recommend killing heretics, in other words, in this very passage right here. So don't tell me, oh, the Catholic Church, they, they, they never killed anybody. Yes, they did. Yes, they did. And they want to in the future. And they will in the future. They have crusades, specifically crusades against Islam. But let's continue here. 
Verse 7, And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman, and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath the seven heads and ten horns. The beast that thou sawest was, and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder, whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they behold the beast that was, and is not, and yet is. Now there's a whole lot that we can get into, but the point is here that I want to make for this study. The Roman Catholic Church controls the beast. She rides the beast, which means when you're riding a beast, you're in control of it. Okay? She controls not only the kings of the earth up here, verses, verse 2. She's also controlling this coming world uh, spiritual and political leader, the Antichrist, the beast. The Roman Catholic Church controls everything right now, pretty much. Pretty bad situation. But how do we get to this point? The false prophet calls us all to worship the beast and to take his mark. All right. Again, we're going backward in time. This is the 100% sure word of prophecy. This one I can tell you absolutely is going to happen without a shadow of a doubt. The Roman Catholic Church will be in complete control. Again, you have the Holy Roman Empire uh, centuries ago that controlled a lot of Europe, specifically Germany and things. Um, you have just power from the, Rome, the Roman Catholic Church. They, you know, they, they went to war with some of the Vikings, and all of a sudden the Vikings, the Viking kings were becoming Catholics to unify the Viking tribes. And then they all merged into Catholicism, and it, they basically were assimilated into Catholic, uh, the, the Catholic rel religious slash um, culture. And Catholic means universal, interesting. But they're absorbed into it, and all of a sudden the Viking culture is gone. They're just Catholics now. And this culture is destroyed, and that culture is destroyed. You see? They get into bed with the whore, with the harlot, the Roman Catholic Church. And all of a sudden, they're like her. They've committed fornication with her. And they get assimilated into that system. That's what's going on. So we have the beast that's controlled by the great harlot, by the Roman Catholic Church. Then here you have the false prophet causes everybody to worship the beast and to take his mark. Let's check that out. Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13, verse 11 through 18. And you know, it, oh, well, I, I'm not a Christian. I don't believe in the Bible. And well, you, you ought to get a copy of this King James Bible here if you can read English and speak English. And you ought to look these things up. And then look at the news and see what's going on. Revelation 13, verse 11, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And he exerciseth, exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, which we'll see here in a minute, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Stop right there. Again, what did the Roman Catholic Church do throughout the Dark Ages? They gave people images to worship. They take away literature. And they give people images, big churches, statues of saints, holy relics. And all of a sudden, the people are illiterate. If you don't read this King James Bible, you don't know what's going on. I don't care what your culture is or what your history is or whatever else. If you've never read this book, you have no clue what's going on. None. And the Vatican's greatest desire is to turn people against this book. That's why they came out with so many corrupted counterfeits of this King James Bible, like the New American Standard Version, the New King James Version, the New International Version, the English Standard Version, the Dewey Reams, the list them. The Vatican has never recommended this King James Bible. And if you grew up Catholic, you know that you were warned about reading the King James Bible. I've talked to countless Catholics and they say the same thing. Yeah, we weren't allowed to read this. This is a condemned book right here. King James Version is a condemned book. You ought to pick up a copy and find out why the Catholic Church doesn't recommend this and why they hate this blessed book. It's very important. Verse 16, 
And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. Kind of like that. And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Here is wisdom, let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred three score and six. Three sixes. Hmm. Six, six, six is what it equates out to. Okay, we'll talk more about that here in a little bit. But the whole point is, you say, well, that, oh, this is just crazy. This little conspiratorial thing, this mark of the beast thing, this is crazy. Oh, really? Um, why don't you study the current events, current news, where many countries are going cashless? And there's all this talk about, well, the coronavirus could be transmitted through cash and giving of cash and everything else, so we need to go to digital money. And we need to implant chips into you and make sure that you're safe so we can monitor your health. And we need to get this vaccine into you and it, and it has a quantum dot technology and all this other stuff to, to keep you safe. Of course, that's all it's about. Uh-huh. Could a cashless system be in our near future? Yes, absolutely. Most countries are ready to go into complete, total um, financial destruction. It's amazing it's, it's been taken this long, uh, lasted this long. Um, yeah, we are heading into a cashless future. There's no question about that. And a 400-plus-year-old Bible told you so. Finished being translated in 1611. And you can, I have older facsimile editions of it and, and older printed editions and things. Facsimile meaning photo scanned and printed, okay, of original 1611, you know, authorized version copies. And I have Bibles here that are 200 years old, um, printed over 200 years ago. And uh, those all say the same thing as I just read to you from this more modern printing of the King James Version. How would a King James Bible? that was printed in 1611, how would it know about a future coming cashless system if it's not God's perfect word? And it's funny because most of the corrupt counterfeit versions that come out of the Vatican with the Vaticanus and Sinaiticus and things, most of those, those are Greek manuscripts if you don't know, most of those um, have changed Revelation 13. So it's no longer in the right hand. It's no longer an implanted microchip. It's no longer that type of a thing there. And the Bible, by the way, I'll say this, the King James Bible does teach in the right hand or in the forehead, but in Revelation 20, verse 4, it also says upon. So there will be a mark, physical mark upon the forehead. What's the one religion that does Ash Wednesday and puts a mark upon the forehead? Hmm. Yeah, I wonder. Look it up if you don't know what I'm talking about. Ash Wednesday. Just, that's all you got to look up. Next, we have Antichrist rises to power by satanic war. Let's look about that. Revelation 13, verses 1 through 8. See, we're coming up through, but Revelation 13, verse 1 through 8 is very important. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And again, if you're new to the Bible and you're reading this and thinking, what is this, a beast rising up as ten heads? Understand it's symbolic, okay? Very much symbolic, which we can't get into here in this study. Um, and the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon which gave power unto the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast who was able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Again, a lot of symbolic type of... of language there, a lot of things that are going on. You might not understand that if you're lost, but there is a coming a world ruler who is going to be an imitation of Christ, an antichrist, a copy 
a counterfeit. And this man is going to be worshipped. And there's actually going to be an assassination attempt made. And his right eye is darkened. And so he's now just got the one eye. And he comes back to life. And people are going to say, this guy has to be God. And the whole world's going to worship him. All right? Again, these are prophecies that are sure. And I can tell you, as a matter of fact, that there's only one system that can do this. And that is the Roman Catholic Church. So, <clears throat> Revelation 13, verses 1 through 8, brings it down to here. Revelation chapter 6. Let's go back to Revelation chapter 6. <clears throat> verse 1. And I saw when the lamb, lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. A rider on a white horse going forth to conquer. Hmm. Almost like another crusade. That's exactly what it's going to be. Another Roman Catholic crusade coming in the future. And uh, we're already kind of in some of that with Afghanistan and Iraq and the, the war with the uh, different countries against the Muslim nations. That's just a precursor to what's coming in the future. Verse... Uh, <clears throat> Three And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And be I beheld, and lo, a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, a measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. And see, thou hurt not the oil and the wine. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was Death, and Hell followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword, and with hunger, and with death, and with the beasts of the earth. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God, and for the testimony which they held. Remember the Antichrist in Revelation 13, power is given unto him to make war with the saints. All right? Saints is a term that appears throughout the Bible. Old Testament saved people are called saints. People within the church age in the New Testament, saints. People in the future time of Jacob's trouble, which this is, or what we're reading about here, also called saints. doesn't mean that Christians, today the body of Christ goes into that time period. I've done plenty of other studies on that to prove that. Uh, verse 11 or excuse me, um, verse 10, And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. All right? Um, war, and it leads to war on saints, war on saved people in the future. Those people who refuse to take the mark of the beast, who refuse to worship the Antichrist. Again, you say, well, I don't understand the lamb and the, the, this rider and the white horse, the red horse, the black horse, the pale horse, death and hell. I, I don't get it. You don't have to understand all those things. Okay? All you have to know is what it's leading up to. This man is coming, this Antichrist, and he's going to rise to power. The Bible talks about by peace he destroys many. He comes in peaceably and obtains the kingdom by flatteries. He comes and he makes a, he confirms a covenant with many for one week, with the Jewish people, in other words. And they say, well, it's going to be peace between the Jews and the Muslims. There's not one verse of Scripture to prove that. Not one. And Daniel chapter 9, verse 27 doesn't say a thing about Muslims and Jews getting along. That thing has, is a lie that's been perpetuated for a long time. There's nothing there. It's a covenant between the Antichrist system and the people of Israel. That's what it's about. And you look into what's really going on over in Jerusalem. There's a holy shrine there. The the um, I forget what the thing is called, but it's the Knights of the Equestrian, Equestrian Order is over there. The, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. There you go. That's what it's called. There's Catholic holy sites in Jerusalem. And they're constantly in negotiations, the Vatican and Israel, to get different holy sites and whatever else. The Muslims, they're just getting pushed out of the area. And they will be more and more as time goes by. And when the Antichrist shows up, 
rides in on the white horse, they're going to say, Christ has returned, and he's going to say yes, and let's get rid of these Muslims and anybody else that opposes us. Forced conversion is what's coming, in other words. So, again, this is what you need to understand. You don't have to understand what the all these different symbology type of things in the book of Revelation. That's not the important part right now. The important part is seeing this movement coming in, seeing the Roman Catholic rise to power. All right? Next, we have preparing the armies of the Antichrist. You see, the Antichrist, when he comes, he brings war. He goes forth conquering and to conquer. The red horse rider comes, takes peace from the earth. And then famine comes. That's what happens as a result of war. But does the Antichrist just show up and say, hey, who will join me? Um, well, I don't think so. Um, I believe, and this is current prophecy stuff, this is where we're getting into what's going on right now. The army of the Antichrist is going to be prepared in the not too distant future. Okay, right now, the the armies of the world, yeah, they're fairly substantial, but uh, the biggest army is yet to come. Okay, well, what do we have? Prepare the armies of the Antichrist. First Thessalonians chapter five. Turn in your King James Bible to First Thessalonians chapter five. Chapter 4, verses 16 through 18, talks about the body of Christ being called up, which happens before the beginning of the time of Jacob's trouble. The body of Christ is in Revelation chapter 5. Revelation 6 is when the Antichrist is unleashed. Okay, many people call it the pre trib rapture. It's called the pre-time of Jacob's trouble catching away right there. I've proved it for years and years and years. You have no excuse if you're a post-tribber. Uh, your system is false. Uh, the Catholic Church has always been the one that's taught that. You've been deceived. You've been lied to. I'm going to prove it here again. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as prevail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Two different groups of people. Okay, One is saying peace and safety, and sudden destruction comes upon them. They go into the time of Jacob's trouble. There's another one that escapes. you got to get a hold of that. Okay? You say, well, I don't believe in a pre-trib fib or whatever, pre-trib rapture and all that. Then what do you do here? Okay? There's two different groups. One goes into the destruction. One escapes. Uh, peace is taken from the earth. So don't tell me, well, you know, the saved go into the time of Jacob's trouble, into the falsely called the Great Tribulation. They save go in and then they kind of escape. No, the peace is taken from the earth. The only way, there's no escape here on the earth from what's coming. The only way to escape what's coming is to be called up to be with the Lord. The catching away of the body of Christ. That's what's going on here. And see, for many years, I've struggled with this thing of, uh, is it going to be that people are saying we are, we have peace and we have safety um, and then sudden destruction comes upon them? Or is it they're saying we have war and we want peace and safety? Well, I'm now firmly convinced of the second option there. The second one that I said, uh, people are going to be in a state of war and they're going to want peace and safety. And it actually gets worse. Okay, That's what's going on there. Um, nobody out there that has any mind at all that works can look at the future and say, I think things are getting better. I think things are really heading for good times of peace. We're heading into war. Um, it's going to get bad, and it's going to get bad probably very soon, within a month or two. So, I'm saying. Um, when the selection thing happens in America, I think it's a big tipping point. Um, and I'm going to talk more about it here as we continue. But um, it's going to get bad. Uh, there's going to be a lot of killing coming up. Um, it's already starting. The Civil War, the, the internal fighting is already happening here in America, and it's going to get a lot worse. That's what's coming. Um, so it's going to get really bad, and I'm going to talk about how this army of the Antichrist is going to um, be built, and uh, that they'll be ready to fight for the Antichrist because they've had experience fighting, which is what we're going to get into next. But right here, when it gets real bad in the future, and there's a lot of war, and a lot of people are going to die, and probably some saved people will die in that number as well. 
save people that didn't take heed to the warnings of getting away from the cities and things and the bad places where they should have been away from, uh, getting away and get, getting out and, and, and whatever else, leaving jobs, leaving homes, leaving whatever they had to do. Remember that you read the book of Acts, the church is being scattered when persecution comes. They aren't just standing their ground and saying, well, I have my job here and I have my house and I have all this other stuff, so I just have to stay here. No, they're leaving. They're fleeing. Okay? If you haven't taken heed to that advice, if the Holy Spirit hasn't convicted you of living in wicked places, well, then there's a good chance you're going to be dying in the not-too-distant future. Sorry, I've tried to warn people. I'm just going to be honest with you. But it's going to be a real bad time, a horrible time, and they're going to want peace and safety. The Antichrist comes in and he obtains the kingdom by flatteries. He comes in peaceably. I'm here to bring peace. All we have to do is just kill off these heretics and then we'll have it. What the Catholic Church has always done. Most of the people that are in this Antichrist army, well, all of them that are in the Antichrist army, are going to go right into the time of Jacob's trouble. Right in there. The saved escape. It's called the pre-time of Jacob's trouble catching away, if you want the real term there. All right? And finally, the way you prepare the army of the Antichrist is by igniting the right. The right-wing fascism. The Antichrist comes in, study it out. Fascism is... Everybody is bound together and serving one leader. Okay, who? What, what was one of the political systems that was known for right-wing fascism? The fascist Nazis. What were the Nazis? They were in bed with the Roman Catholic Church. Adolf Hitler talked about, he bragged about the Catholic Church in Mein Kampf. Um, that's what they were. I mean, they signed a concordant before the war started with the Vatican. You know, just... Franz von Papen signed the Concordat with uh, Pope Pius XII, I think it was. Um, I mean, there, there's no denying the history, the truth of, of history, that the Vatican and the, and the uh, Nazi movement were working together. All right? Nobody denies that, that knows anything about history. Okay? But right-wing fascism, it'll start out with right-wing fascism, the Antichrist movement. And maybe eventually they'll try to get into socialism, communism, I don't know, where everybody has everything all equal and whatever after you've taken the mark. But in order to get that army, right-wing fascism has to rise. And so right now there's a lot of people uh, that would be right-wing fascist that would support the Antichrist army, but they're living nice, peaceful little lives and they, they have their business and they have their job, whatever, whatever they do, if they're in business for themselves or work at a job, I'm saying. They have their mortgaged home, they have their vehicles, they have lots of nice things. They don't want to think about war right now. But uh, as time goes by, more and more war is coming. And they can see it. They can see the cities being burned down. They can see the increase in violence. They can see the country that they once knew and loved is disappearing very rapidly. What's going on? You've got to build a fire underneath the right wing. And how do you build a fire? Death. Lots of death. From both sides, by the way. Not only do you kill right-wingers, do you destroy their way of life to ignite them, to enrage them and get them angry and ready for war, but you also kill the enemy as an encouragement. You let the right-wingers come up and start to slaughter their, their enemies, the left wing. That's what you do. You incite hatred and violence and, and anger. That's what you do. Ignite the right is what's happening right now. We're in the early stages of it. We haven't seen the worst yet. It's going to get a lot worse, which we're going to be talking about as we continue. But let's go to Matthew chapter 24. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 24, and I'm going to show you now. We've gone way out into the future, years away from now. We've already seen a lot of it, but not the full to the full extent of total, complete Catholic control. But we see that this woman is going to ride a Antichrist, a this man called the beast. There's going to be a false prophet that causes a cashless system, mark of the beast system. The Antichrist is going to rise to power by a satanic war. The devil, the dragon gives him his power and uh, makes war against the saints. And the armies of the Antichrist have to be prepared before the Antichrist shows up, which happens by igniting the right. Okay, Matthew chapter 24 talks about this, where we are right now, beginning in verse 3. And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming, and of the end of the world? Now, it doesn't mean the end of the world as in the world ceases to exist, because if you understand the Bible, 
There's a thousand years of peace that Jesus brings in after the time of Jacob's trouble, after the Antichrist and the wars and everything else. So it's talk, talking about that time there, the end of the world of Satan running things, being the God of this world, which we'll talk about as we continue. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. A lot of false Christs, a lot of people calling themselves Christians, and they're false. They're deceiving you. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Hmm. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Jesus is speaking to his Jewish disciples. There's a lot of Jews here in America that need to get back to Israel. They're going to be hated of all nations for the sake of Jesus Christ. And many, and then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. That's where we are right now. You're seeing all those things right now. If you're truly honest, you can read through that list and say, yeah, wars, rumors of wars, you know, nation rising against nation, kingdom against kingdom, um, famines, pestilences, earthquakes, um, you know, people hating the Jews there, um, many being offended, betraying one another and hating one another. Um, we're seeing it. I mean, we're seeing all these things. Neighbors that once would get along and go out and talk to each other, now one's wearing a mask and the other's not, and, and the one without the mask is mad at the one with the mask, and the masked person is mad at the one without the mask, and they're, what, stay away from me. You have to stay six feet away from me or whatever it is in your country. It's getting insane quickly, isn't it? Yes, it is. Why? Because we are in the beginning of sorrows right there, and it's going to get worse and worse and worse. That's what's coming to this world. Okay? But here's the important thing to get. God's seven steps of judgment. You see, what this whole thing is really about is God's judgment, which we'll see here in a little bit. But we're not going to get ahead of ourselves now, are we? God's seven steps of judgment. Number one, economic crash. God will destroy a country financially when they turn against him, when they turn against his book. God will not bless them anymore economically. Natural disasters. God will send bad things. We saw it right there in Matthew chapter 24. Earthquakes and, and things like that. Starvation is another one. We'll see that as well as we continue here. Disease comes as a result of starvation. War and killing. Ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. Tyranny. Nation rising up against nation. Kingdom against kingdom. Tyrants coming to power unjust political rulers, rape and perversion, all throughout the Bible. People turn against the Lord. The Lord oftentimes will send the troops in there and just, you know, rape the women, ravish the women, the Bible talks about. Um, it's happened all throughout history. It's, well, I just can't believe. You're ignorant of history. And you say, well, you know, if you're an evolutionary atheist or something, you say, well, this is just cruel and whatever. Well, look at your system. <laughs> look at evolution. What does evolution teach? Evolution teaches that the strongest survive, the weak are eliminated. So why would you have a problem with any of this stuff? And if you do, well, you're again, you're very ignorant of, script, of uh, history, not even scripture, but just regular secular history. Look back through history, look at all the wars and all the fighting and all the death and everything else. You say, well, why would a loving God do that? Because God gave man a free will. But man gets to a point where man is so wicked, God says, I have to do something to punish man. So God brings these systems in. Let me go over a couple points here. What about this? Right here, God's seven steps of judgment. You see, we're going to talk about this as we continue. Right down here, a little church building here. This church right here is supposed to keep God's judgment away from a nation. Um, when judgment comes, it begins at the house of God. The Bible talks about that. So what do we have? economic crash here in America coming. Why? Well, um, first and foremost, because churches don't preach against anybody getting into debt. 
I mean, when, when have you ever gone to any kind of a church? Those of you out there that have gone to churches, when have you ever gone to one and heard the preacher speak against being in debt? I'm one of the very few preachers that's ever preached against being in debt and ever preached in, in favor of debt-free living. Save up your money and buy it. Don't go into debt. Don't get a mortgage. Don't get a car loan. Don't, get, don't have payments, credit cards, and whatever else. But most preachers don't preach it. Why? Because they have church buildings that are mortgaged. They have to keep that image going. You know, it's true. When's the last time you ever heard any churches saying you should never invest in the stock market? Stock market investments are dishonest gain. It's a system of, it's a, basically a system of gambling. Hey, I'll put my money on this one here, this company here. I hope that they do good. You're gambling. You're not working for that money. You're giving it into the stock market and hoping to get rich by somebody else, by their labors and how they do things and how the market's manipulated and whatever else. And if you're in the stock market too, by the way, and you claim to be saved, your fortune is going to be wiped out soon. Okay? Look at the interest rates go in, in the thing there and the inflation and, and the money printing that's coming in from the Federal Reserve and the fact that the Federal Reserve, I heard recently, owns one in three mortgages now. They're buying up things and, and the stock buyback type of stuff. I mean, you can look into all this stuff. You're crazy in the head if you have your money in the stock market. Not only that, you're in very serious sin. The Lord's not for that. But again, how many churches are preaching this stuff? How many pastors are willing to stand up in the pulpit and say, how dare you be in the stock market? How about gold and silver being real money and not ca cash or digital currency? How many preachers preach on that? And uh, by the way, you say, well, then we should have gold and silver for the future. Uh, no, because in the book of James, it's actually said to be condemned in the future. Um, the, they're useless. People have stockpiled gold and silver for the last days, for the end times, and even that doesn't work because you have digital currency coming in the future. So your stockpiles of gold and silver, it is biblical money, but the Antichrist system is going to be so bad that your biblical money is not going to be worth anything. But again, how many churches are even preaching that? They're not. Why? Because they have a business that they run. It's literally a corporation under IRS code section 501c3, a tax-exempt corporation. It's a business, in other words. It's a social club. That's what the churches are. So an economic crash is certain, especially in America. Economic crash will happen soon. I mean, shutting down businesses, shutting down stores and everything else because of a virus that, that kills less than 1% of the people that actually get it. I mean, it's ridiculous. And such a small portion of the population even supposedly gets the thing. You know, you can get it and you don't even know that you had it. I mean, it's ridiculous. Let's, let's just shut down the economy as a result of that and send people checks. Just print up money and send them checks so that they can stay home and not work. Again, in violation of Scripture. Economic crash is sure to happen. Absolutely, 100%. I'll guarantee you that one too. Another 100% sure word of prophecy. Again, because how do you know? The mark of the beast system comes in, so you can't have cash. You can't have gold and silver. People buying and selling without the mark of the beast. That can't happen. So again, it's another sure word of prophecy. How about natural disasters? You say, what's the church have to do with natural disasters? Well, I want you to think about a couple points there. How many churches actually trust that the Lord will protect their church building through natural disasters? Never heard of one. They have insurance policies. Well, what if we had a storm? What if there's flood damage? What if this? What if that? What if we had a fire? What if we have... The they have all kinds of insurance policies. So you take out an insurance policy from a secular company to protect your church in case God does something to it. A little bit of a, a you know problem there, a little hypocrisy there, all right? Um, and how many preachers are willing to say that these natural disasters, the fires in California, are the result of God judging the wicked out there? Oh, look at the Hollywood actors and things that have lost their homes out in the hills of California and Beverly Hills. and th Good, burn them out, burn them out. I'm glad to hear that. I am. Those people are wicked. They've done lots of wicked things. But how many preachers are willing to come out and say that? Not very many. The churches are supposed to be there to keep away God's judgment. And yet they're keeping their mouth shut because they're social clubs, as I said. <clears throat> and what's another thing? The whole thing of the thing of natural disasters and why the church, how they drop the ball, so to speak. That is, the churches 
are actually sending relief to areas where God's judging. <laughs> you know, I remember years ago, this there was this uh, big earthquake and, and everything down in Haiti and, and whatever else. And I had a brother at the time and he said, spiritual brother, and, and he said about, you know, it's just terrible. You know, we should send relief. And I said, don't send him a cent. He said, what? And I said, that country dedicated their, their, the whole nation, the president dedicated the whole nation to Satan a number of years ago. They deserved exactly what they got. Don't send them aid. Don't go in there and help them out. But yet the churches do. Well, we got to be there to help people. And oh, you're, you're under God's judgment. God destroyed your home. God destroyed your li livelihood and everything else. Let's help you get back up on your feet again. Why? <laughs> Just insane. How about starvation? Well, what's the church doing to bring that about? 10% tithe. You got to keep the corporation going. Your church comes first. Make sure that you give that money to your church. Hmm. And uh, not only that, um, when's the last time you ever heard any of these churches? I mean, there might be a few exceptions to this, but most churches I've ever been to, they don't tell the people to grow their own food. They don't tell them, hey, you know, maybe avoid the grocery stores and all the bad stuff in there, which we'll get into here in just a minute. Um, try to grow your own food. Let's, let's, let's get together and have, you know, the body of Christ, you know, grow their own food. And, and they don't do that. They don't do that. Which leads to the next point. Disease. When's the last time that you heard any preacher judging big pharma uh, and the medical establishment in general? You say, well, they're, they're, I've heard some preachers preach against vaccination. Do they preach against medication? Do they preach against going to the doctor? No, a lot of times these preachers are talking about, yeah, I got back from the doctor and, and whatever. What on earth are you going to some doctor for that believes in evolutionary medicine? allopathic medicine, I think it's what it's called, where they, they, they treat symptoms and, and things with, with chemicals. And I, I, I could go off on a major rant here, but yet how many Christians are even warned about this from the pulpit? No, it's all, oh, please pray, pray for brother so-and-so. He's got diabetes and please pray for sister so-and-so. She's got cancer now and please pray for this person and that person. I'm going to the doctor next week myself to have my checkup. <laughs> Where's the Holy Spirit leading these people into truth? He's not. The church is silent about things that are making people sick. And you know what's going to happen. The vaccination, forced vaccination stuff comes out. There will be people in church buildings that are going to be getting it. Guarantee it. What about nutritional health advice? The Bible talks about the gifts of healing. One of the gifts of healing is nutrition. Use little, little wine for thy stomach's sake and thine often infirmities. Paul gives that advice to Timothy. That's nutritional health. Fermented grape juice. The probiotics and things in there and stuff, the good back bacteria, the beneficial bacteria. Paul is advising that. Hey, here's some ways to make yourself healthier. How many preachers do that? Hmm. Now how about obese Christians? You see that? Lots of disease in these church buildings showing that uh, they're not escaping God's judgment. They're actually bringing it to this country. Remember, when God judges a nation, He judges people that profess to be saved first. How about war and killing? Right there. Well, uh, what do you have with the church buildings? Most of them are pro-military. They honor the veterans and honor the, the military and everything else. Thank you for your service and whatever else. Well, I'm not, I don't hate somebody because they've been in the military, but I'll tell you what, you look at what these wars are, they're fake, they're crooked, they're corrupt. The military should be condemned from the church pulpits. Hey, look at this, don't ask, don't tell stuff, and the sodomy in the military and, the, and all these wicked things. I mean, they're using depleted uranium for ammunition. Soldiers are dying, they're getting crippled and things like that. Oh, young people, oh, so-and-so, he just graduated high school and he's going off to the military. You know, let's, let's applaud him. No, warn the boy. Don't go into the military. You're going to be used for a Vatican crusade. What in the world are you doing going sending people into the military? But the churches are pro-military. They're all for that war and killing. And again, they say, Let's, let's support the troops as they go over to a country and fight wars that, benef that don't benefit us at all. You know, I mean, what about the thing of the original constitution here in America, the original republic that we had? We're not supposed to get entangled in foreign affairs. Let's just not, you know, let's, let's not talk about that. 
So let's let's support the troops that are over fighting wars, useless wars of of you know for oil and for drugs and whatever else to support big pharma. Let's let's support that. But what about righteous fighting and and raising up armies and things and saying, hey, you know what? That's wrong. Let's go and march against that. Let's go and if we have to fight, we'll fight. Not to, to form a Christian kingdom or anything like that, but hey, righteous men need to stand up and fight against this injust. Of course not. Of course not. Let's be pacifists at home and send our warring ways or whatever else over to some other country, someplace, to fight a useless war for the Vatican. Disgusting. How about tyranny? Tyranny. 501c3. Muzzling the, the little hirelings up there in the pulpit. You can't speak against this. You can't talk about poli I can't tell you who to vote for. I can't tell you this. I can't tell you that. From the pulpit? Where do you see that in the book of Acts? Where is anybody ever in there saying, well, I, there are certain things I can't really say here, you know, among the saints. Well, there's supposed to be separation of church and state. Oh, that's right. If you want to get your good tax benefits, if you want to get your good money thing, you know, going, then you have to kind of yoke up to the state and just kind of keep quiet about a few things. Yeah. And of course, you know, what's another reason? Well, because the pastors, you know, they love the power of being a tyrant themselves. Don't question the man of God, the whole thing like that in these churches. Single pastor systems and they run the thing. It's their little cult, little cult of personality. When they die, the cult falls apart. Absolutely. And again, these churches are telling people, submit to that tyranny to continue your worldly lifestyle. I mean, look at the average life of the average church-going person and look at the life of a lost person, it's almost identical. They just do something different on a Sunday. And a lot of times lost people are better to deal with in business than quote-unquote Christians. And you know it if you, you know, if you know anything. Finally, what about rape and perversion with these church buildings? Babel buildings are ancient perversion buildings. They have uh, phalluses there, obelisks basically as the steeple and a lot of them have a Greek Parthenon type of look on the front. That's what they do. They're, I mean, study. Where did church buildings come from? The Catholic Church took pagan buildings and Christianized them so that they could draw the pagans into their system of worship. They took their pagan gods and they renamed them with people's names from the Bible. You know, Mary, Joseph, and the Jesus of Catholicism. That's, that's a fake pagan Jesus. And he is, you know, hey, um, eat my flesh and drink my blood. Well, if you read the Bible, it's symbolic, clearly symbolic when John chapter 6, when Jesus is talking about it. But the Catholics say, no, it's actually his, his physical flesh and blood. Why didn't anybody come up and eat him, you know, grab, a, you know, bite his arm and drink the blood? Nobody did that. Obviously, Jesus was speaking spiritually, symbolically. He wasn't talking about the, the physical, literal, come up here, you know, take a bite out of my arm and drink the blood. But the Catholics believe that. They believe that the, the priest can magically change the, the host and the wine into the actual flesh and blood of God. And that the way you get God inside of you is that you have to eat him and drink his flesh. It's satanic cannibalism is what Roman Catholicism is. Disgusting. And that's what the whole church building thing is. I mean, show me one verse of scripture in the King James Bible that says to, you know, people, they're saved people, build a church building. Build a building and call it a church. There's no scripture for that. Well, what about divorce? Sex perversion in church buildings. Divorce among the adults, fornication among the youth. Happens all the time. There's no difference between the professing saved in church buildings and lost people. It's all the time. Why? They're in ancient pagan buildings that were once used for sex orgies back in the ancient Greek culture. <laughs> And again, another thing where the uh, churches have really dropped the ball, no condemnation of TV, movies, and the kind of music out there that encourages fornication, like rock and roll or rap music. They actually bring it into these places now. Disgusting. Absolutely despicable. So what do you have? And here's the thing it's important to get. God is judging. It's the beginning of sorrows right now that we are currently in. And these are the things that we're going to see more and more and more of. And why? Because God is done with organized religion. 
they had their chance. There were people in church buildings in the past that were innocent, that were ignorant of things, whatever else. But as more and more preachers have come out and said, hey, you know what? Church buildings aren't in the New Testament. They're not there. And, you know, this isn't there and that isn't there. People need to come out of these structures. And you say, well, I'm just not convinced. Okay, how about the coronavirus thing? All of a sudden, all these strong, militant church buildings are closing their doors because, because the government told them to do it. And then they're reopening and they're putting masks on and they're sitting six feet apart and they're scanning foreheads and they're doing all this other stuff. And you say, well, well, ours didn't. Well, okay, it will in the future. You will compromise. And you know, I get these people, ours didn't do those things. You're lying to me. A lot of you are. I know you are. I've been around church building people. They're, they're idolaters. They're liars. But what's going on? All the stuff that's happening right now is proof that God has done with the whole church building system. This thing is satanic. It's over. It's never been sanctioned in Scripture. And so God's judgment is now going to come not only on the lost world, it's also going to come on these people that are in these church buildings. And I think it's going to be a lot harsher on them. And it's going to lead to a lot of death. Okay? I mean, they're already the, the different people, Black Lives Matter and Antifa and whatever else. You can see the hatred for, for this system right here. And they're destroying these pagan buildings and whatever else. It's going to lead to death in this whole system here. And uh, you say, well, okay, what does this have to do with everything? Amos chapter 3, verse 6. Back to the Old Testament. <clears throat> I'm going to read a very important verse of Scripture to you that you need to understand. Because you can blame a lot of this stuff that's going on and everything else on the Illuminati or the Jesuits or the Bilderbergers or the or a Davos conference thing or whatever there in Switzerland. Um, you, can, you can blame it on the Freemasons, on the, you know, whoever. But what's really going on here? Amos chapter 3, verse 6. Shall a trumpet be blown in the city, and the people not be afraid? Shall there be evil in a city, and the Lord hath not done it? That's something a lot of people have a problem with. They think that God is the big teddy bear up in the sky that just does nice things for everybody. Um, God has standards of righteousness. God has standards by which you need to be saved. All right? And if you don't do that, if you refuse salvation, biblical salvation, then God's judgment his anger comes upon you. He brings evil into your city, into your town, into your country, into your life. God is the one who's bringing all this stuff to pass. Why? Because he's done with organized religion. Those of us that are genuinely born again, we can't even get along with people in these church buildings anymore. You meet people that are go to church buildings, there's so many things we have uh, differences on and whatever else, I, I can't even be around them. Christian bookstores and whatever else, I don't even go into those places. They're so filled with wickedness and evil. Stuff that's just, that's not according to the scriptures. This is a lie. That's a lie. What are you selling this thing for? Yeah. And, it, and more and more they're going, these church buildings are becoming more and more Catholic as time goes by. We're Trinitarian. We wear Sunday best. We have, you know, the holy preacher up there and everything. It's all just Catholic stuff. You won't find that stuff in the Bible. And again, you know, I've proved these things over the years. So, right here, God is going to bring a lot of death to start the movement that he said is going to happen right here. God judges the world. The world wants wickedness and sin and whatever else. Okay, the Lord's going to give it to you. And it's going to lead to a lot of people dying. Huge amount of people dying. And uh, interesting little point I want to make here. What's the verse? Amos chapter 3, verse 6. Hmm. Good way to remember where this verse is at. Three sixes. One, two, three. Six, six, six. Good way to remember Amos chapter 3, sixes. 3, verse 6. Thought that was kind of interesting. But there is coming this Mark of the Beast system. There is coming this whole thing right here. It is going to happen. And this, this is your future. Right here. You say, well, what do I do? Is there some other thing that we can do? Well, right here. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 31. This is where we're going to end this study. I'm going to make a few other points after I'm done with this. 
But we'll finish up here with this passage of Scripture, a very important passage of Scripture. Because when God finishes off with uh, dealing with uh, a church, um, and again, you understand that these buildings here were never, that's not the church, but saved people used to go to those places. Uh, not anymore. Saved people have gotten out of them. If you haven't been convinced by now, then you're lost. <laughs> but uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 31, For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. This is your safest place to be right here. If you're saved, if you're born again, if you're lost, you better start judging yourself too. You better start to say, you know what, maybe I should uh, get a King James Bible. Maybe I should start to read. Maybe I should start to look at some things. Judge yourself. Self-judgment is a healthy thing to do. You know, I mean, even if you, you're you just the most atheistic, God-hating, Bible-rejecting reprobate out there, you can still look at your life and say, you know what, i got to get the, rid of this drinking problem. You know, i, I got to quit smoking these cigarettes. You know, lost people had better standards 100 years ago than most professing Christians do today. Right? So you can judge yourself. Anybody can judge themselves. Anybody can say, I need to be a harder worker. I need to be better to my wife. I need to be kinder to my children. I need to spend more time with my children. I need That's all self-judgment. Everybody has to start judging themselves. You have to say, hey, you know what? What if rioting comes to this town? Rioting has come to this town. Things are getting worse. Maybe I better judge myself and say, you know what? I shouldn't be here. I got to get out of this situation. That's self-judgment. If we judge ourselves, we, aren't, we should not be judged. The Lord's going to bring evil. The Lord's bringing all this stuff right here because the church has failed. The church is wicked. God's done with this. I can tell you right now, this whole coronavirus thing... That's the nail, the final nail in the coffin of organized religion. They all collapsed. They all fell. And what's going to happen? This system here comes as a result of the church's failing. God brings his judgment in this form right here. Church failed. It's going to lead to massive death, which will ignite the right, prepare, which will prepare the armies of the Antichrist. These guys are going to get the kill. They're going to get the... If you think that the left is going to win what's coming in the future... You are foolish, okay? You are very foolish. Black Lives Matter, Antifa, whatever else, if you're in that movement, you better get out quick, all right? You think that you're going to go and whatever, well, George Soros backing us up, and whatever the whole thing, I don't even care. These guys are going to get slaughtered. The, the Excuse me, the, the left. The left will get slaughtered. The right is going to be risen up to prepare the armies of the Antichrist. The Antichrist is going to come and he'll rise to power by satanic war. I believe with Islam, mostly. False prophet calls us all to worship the beast and take his mark. Yeah, why? Because the economy has been destroyed. There's no choice in the future. Those that have survived this time here and all the other bad stuff over there, they're going to be taking the mark and worshiping the beast. The great harlot rides the beast. The Roman Catholic Church is in control. There you go. Guaranteed. I'm guaranteed. It's, there's no question. The question is, how much time do we have before this really gets bad down here? How much time do we have before the mass killing starts? Because it is coming very, very soon. Well, how much time we have depends on how much you judge yourself. You see? That's what's very important here. All right. And let me just make a couple of points here, quickly here, some things I wrote down and um, finish up with some little, little bit of advice like I've already been given here. But part of this whole system right here is going to be forced conversion. Again, study history. Study ancient history. The Catholics, when they take power, they forcibly convert. It's convert or die. You're with us or you're with the terrorists. Very important to understand that. Secondly, Again, as I mentioned earlier, Catholic knighthoods. Study Catholic knighthoods. A lot of people just think, well, that's stuff that happened in the past, the First Crusades and the Knights Templar and this order was brought up and whatever. Look into some of these guys that are ruling things. Okay, Look at their connections to the Jesuits. Look at their connections to different Catholic systems, Catholic knighthoods and, and whatever else. Again, you got to check into that stuff. Uh, <clears throat> crusade to destroy Islam. Like I said, I fully believe in that. 
that this war that the Antichrist brings, the satanic rise to power, is a destruction of Islam. I mean, what better way to, to con the Jews into signing a covenant with Catholicism than to say, hey, the carrot on the stick here, Jews, is we'll destroy Islam, your biggest enemy. We'll have a Catholic crusade to wipe out Islam, finally just totally destroy them. Kill all of them, and the, the few that might survive will convert to Catholicism. They'll be faithful Catholics. I believe that that's what's coming. Again, right-wing fascism is how this, this thing is going to start. We'll talk about that more here in just a minute. <clears throat> and uh, another thing you have to remember is right now the largest armed army on the planet is very disorganized. You say, what's that? Americans. American gun owners are the biggest army on earth. No question, the best, uh, most armed, they're a big army. And you... How do you get them to fight? Ignite them. Get them angry. That's what's going on right now. <clears throat> and think about this. Part of this whole movement is the thing of police. Why are the police not stopping the rioters? Why? They could go in there and just say, hey, no, no, sorry. You just burned that thing. You're arrested. You know, and, and just take these rioters away. The police are just standing there watching buildings burn, watching you know everything burn. Why? Because they're trying to ignite the right. The police are under orders from the people that are higher up into the Catholic knighthoods, into the Catholic system. The Catholics are saying, let the cities burn. Let the police vehicles burn. Let people get beat up. Let them say these horrible, vicious things. Because we're trying to incite, we're trying to ignite the right. That's what's happening. <clears throat> And finally, I'll just say this, the 2020 selection, I like to call it. I don't believe in election. Um, I believe that this whole thing that these guys are being selected. Now, it's going to go one of two ways, in my opinion. Uh, if Biden, Joe Biden wins, then what they're going to do is they're going to continue to persecute the right. It's going to get a lot worse. They're going to be killing people that profess to be Christians and whatever else. And God's not going to protect the church buildings. But it's just going to get more and more evil, which will ignite the right. They're going to try to come for guns. They're going to say you can't eat meat. They're going to say, I mean, they're just look at this stuff. It, all these things. That's what they're going to do. It's just going to get worse and worse and worse to further infuriate the right. Okay? What if Trump wins? Again, ignite the right. It's just that simple. Because if Donald Trump wins, what happens is the left-wingers go crazy. And they get angry and they go out and they start doing more rioting and whatever else. And now Trump can say, Okay, we're all ready. It's enough. We've had enough of this, this rioting and this looting. Go on in there and shoot. Police, military, armed civilian, come get a permit or whatever else you would, they would do or however it would work and go out and start shooting these people. If they come to your town, gun them down. Plain and simple. And you'll have the right <clears throat> rising up to get ready for the army there that's going to be created and they're going to go out and they're going to slaughter. Now, I'm just going to give something that I would do if I was part of this system right here and if this happens, it doesn't mean I'm part of it. I'm just saying be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. If they're smart, what they'll do is they'll let Joe Biden win the election and then they'll have Trump refuse to transfer power and they'll have Trump take over and just say, okay, boom, forget the election. I'm not stepping down. That would inflame the left wing so bad that they would just go berserk. And at that point, okay, right wingers, start killing. I don't know. Um, you say, well, well, what do we do? Well, it, it just seems like our hands are tied. Well, God's bringing evil because of people refusing to turn from their wickedness. God is bringing these, all these aspects of judgment right here. You're seeing it. And it's just going to get worse and worse. God is judging harshly. But what can you do? Judge yourself. If we, would be, if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. Get your life cleaned up. Say, Lord, I want to be righteous. I want to be saved if you're lost. You need to be saved. God, please save me. Because if, you know, you get killed if you're saved, well, you get to go to heaven when you die. Um, I mean, look into the thing of salvation. I'll put some links at the end here of the video about salvation, how to be saved and things. You need to do that. 
you need to make sure that you're going to go to heaven when you die. Um, because war is coming. It is the future, the very near future. So that's going to be it for this study. A very detailed study, but uh, something that's been weighing very heavily on my mind. Um, Roman Catholicism, uh, you know, it, it's amazing to me. You know, years ago, uh, John F. Kennedy, um, he came out and, and he was a Catholic. And people were all upset, you know, and Americans were all upset that we would have a Catholic president. This is wrong. This is bad. Because people in the past understood when you're a Roman Catholic, your allegiance is first to the Vatican, first to your church, second to your nation. And people said, we don't want that. That's not religious freedom. That's people saying outside of the Catholic Church, there is no salvation. If you're not a Catholic, you're a heretic. I mean, I have the books to prove it from Roman Catholicism, printed by Roman Catholicism. All right. I mean, I have a whole book of curses, basically, anathemas against people who believe this and that. Anything contrary to Catholicism, you get an, an anathema. I know what Catholics have done down through the centuries. Study history, real true history, and you'll see what I'm talking about. And people used to be worried about it. There was a guy that ran for president, Al Smith, and he was a Roman Catholic back in the early 1900s. And he they had no, he had no chance. They said, get out of here. You're not going to be elected. We don't want a Catholic president. Years later, John Kennedy, okay, first Catholic president, but, you know, he's not really going to do a whole lot. Now, it's just open. You know, the Republican National Convention ended with a Ave Maria thing, this, this uh, Marian thing or whatever. That, Roman Catholic. Trump just appointed a Catholic, you know, woman to the Supreme Court. And, and yet, what are the churches doing? What are these wicked buildings doing? Remaining silent. Trump comes out. We've got to end anti-Catholic bigotry. Hello, church? Where you at? You say, well, what do we do to survive it? <laughs> the only thing you can do, judge yourself. It's what you have to do, saved or lost, you need to judge yourself. You need to get right. You need to get some things out of your life. And if you're lost, you really do need to get saved. All right, I pray that you do. So that's going to be it. Uh, just like I said, a very important study as we see the Catholic takeover now coming onto just the full, here we go, coming out. Um, they're going to start putting heretics to death. They're going to raise up the army of the Antichrist. Lots of death. There you go. So I'm going to put some links to some videos at the end. Please take some time to watch it. And, uh, well, if you're not saved, you better judge yourself. You better get right with God. That's going to be it. Thank you for watching. King James Video Ministries has been faithfully preaching and teaching from God's Word since 2008. Our YouTube channel has never been monetized, and we do not accept money from the lost world because this would violate the Scriptures. King James Video Ministries is supported by saved brethren in accordance with 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 17 through 18. If you have been blessed by our videos, we would ask that you prayerfully consider supporting this ministry financially. You can donate online by visiting www.kingjamesvideoministries.com or by sending a check or money order to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 214, Hatton, Maine, 04765. Thank you to all who donate to this ministry, and we pray for the Lord's blessing in your lives.